So thank you for joining us. Please, if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat and we're going to attend to them every, I think, 10 minutes, 10 to 15, just to keep it a little bit um, flowy. So if, if I can bother you, Alison, with, with the uh, slides, just like count 10 seconds and flip to the other slide because I don't want to take a lot of uh, anyone's time. So uh, if, if you can pass by the first, what, what, what will we cover, the other one? Okay, so we talked about Web3 fundamentals and we went down the memory lane of the web, the internet or the web as we know it now. We went from Web1 to Web2 and then from Web2 to Web3. We were read only, read write, and then read write on. That's the era of, of Web3. And we also... Yeah, we yeah just... Ten seconds uh, is more than enough for me each slide. So we talked about Web3. We talked about how much it was searched on Google and why everyone is was very much interested between 2020 and now in, in Web3 and what it uh, brings to this world. We talked about the Web3 ecosystem. We talked, we, we were um, explaining how Web3 is an actual umbrella. And under this umbrella, we had a lot of innovative and disruptive technologies such as cryptocurrencies, the metaverse, um, immersive tech, augmented reality, virtual realities, uh, and all of that. We also talked about how decentralization is the core infrastructure of all things Web3. And we did this small uh, comparison between centralized and decentralized networks. And we went to the blockchain basis and uh, basics and we explained uh, how a blockchain is, is formed, how is it chained to one another, and we talked about how it's linked, uh, and we cannot change anything on this uh, blockchain, on this system. Yeah, not important. <laughs> I can and this, add, yeah. Yes, please, please do, Natalie. Uh, we also talked about the benefits of the blockchain and the transactions and uh, how we can use Bitcoin and Ethereum. And we talked about hashing, the hashing process that starts with the input and the piece of data, which can be any, any transaction. And each, each hash is a different code. So that's what makes it different for the NFTs. Um, the most popular NFT, uh, uh, the most popular cryptocurrency is Ethereum at the moment. Uh, we talked about gas fees and how in order to buy and sell in the blockchain, you need to have gas fees. So it's, it's gas fees are fuel that powers the Ethereum network. And uh, we talked about smart contracts and how to execute um, a smart contract. It's, it's written all in code, if you guys remember that. And so what are the characteristics of a smart co contract? Um, it's self-verifying, self-executing, and tamper-proof. And then we talked a bit of examples of the Web3, the project um, that, that, that happened, and the user-friendly um websites that are available in the blockchain um such as decentraland audius brave browser um and then we started with part two where uh laura explained about fungible and non-fungible uh so what's the difference between a physical asset and a digital asset um and uh, what is a non fungible token, what an NFT. And we talked briefly about some projects, the first project that ha uh, that happened uh, in the blockchain from 2014 till 2020. So- uh, Listen, if you can skip to part two because we finished the summary. Yes. So uh, um, I'm curious if anyone has any questions from, from the last the last session. That, that they maybe someone studied about it and, and, and had, is curious of any questions. Is curious of not, any questions.
Am I echoing? I feel like oh, I, I feel... So um exactly if we can all um mute the microphones and we're not um speaking, I think that's helpful for the audio quality. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Um Laura, do you, would you like to? Yes, to yes, me? sorry. Yeah. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. So that that is what we brushed uh, on in part one. Now, part two NFTs. We the first slide was uh, an interesting one. We're gonna brush up on it uh, as well. So we talked about uh, the different types of assets. We talked about assets being physical or digital, and they can be fungible or non-fungible. Physical and fungible assets are exactly like money. So one dollar is equal to one dollar. One pound is equal to one pound. Uh, I can give you ten dollars, and you can give me ten notes of one dollars. It's gonna hold the same value. Alison, can we stay, please, on the first one? Definitely. Sorry, I just jumped back. I'll move ahead again. Bear with me one second. Here we go. So these are the fungible and physical assets and non-fungible means that one is not equal to one. And we were talking about precious stones or we were talking about uh, paintings from um, the Mona Lisa, whoever. One image is one, one painting is one painting. You cannot uh, copy it. You cannot make two of it. So that's the non-fungible and physical assets. And then we talked about digital fungible assets, which are the cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, Coin and Ethereum, they are fungible, meaning one Ethereum is equal to one Ethereum, but they're digital, they're not physical, we cannot touch them. And NFTs, as we were saying, non-fungible tokens. So they're digital and non-fungible. It's one of a kind digital asset that you own, that is stored on the blockchain. So uh, we gave a brief uh, overview on uh, yes, thank you. On uh, what are NFTs? So the keywords, they're digital assets, they are stored on the blockchain, and they're unique. You cannot have two identical NFTs that are stored on the blockchain. And what do uh, NFTs promote? It's ownership and authenticity. Ownership meaning that you are the sole owner of this NFT and no one can just wake up and take it uh, away from you and authenticity because it really proves that you are the owner or creator of this digital asset and no one can tamper with that. And, <coughs> sorry, and if we were talk if we are talking about the value on, of NFTs, it, it really depends, just like the value of art, it's all about how much demand there is uh, in, in the market, who is interested in your NFT and why, and uh, if it's a, a preference for them or not. Uh, down the memory lane of NFTs, so it's really worth mentioning, and a lot of people do not know that, they, they think that NFTs started uh, around 2017 or 18, but the first actual NFT, uh, which was called Quantum, it was minted in 2014 on the Namecoin blockchain. However, the significance of the year 2017 is the ERC721, which is the Ethereum request for command 721, which we're going to talk briefly about later on. But this set of codes, it introduced, uh, uh, it uh, not introduced, I'm sorry, it enabled us to create new unique NFTs on the Ethereum network. And that's why uh, Natalie was saying that Ethereum is one of the most famous chains it's because they have created or invented the ERC721 and that allowed NFTs to be uh, minted on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, 2020 till 2022, I'd, I'd say we had an explosion of NFTs. Everyone was on the NFT hype. Uh, it was searched, I don't know how many hundreds and thousands of times. People started buying NFTs right, left and center. Most of them had no idea what they're buying. Uh, the process was a little bit overwhelming to a lot, but they saw a market in, in this um, technological, I'd say, asset or te technological uh, evolution of, of digital assets. Uh, 
And I'm gonna, shall I hand over to you, uh, Natalie? Uh, yes, so as, as we were speaking about the blockchain, um, I feel like it's, it's, it's hard for everyone since the last uh, session, um, if you haven't researched more about it during these days, um, you would know the most important thing that you should know that why are NFTs important? They are important because it's it's a unique uh, form of of data on the blockchain, and uh, mm. through the smart contract, mm. an artist or a project can protect uh, this NFT and have full ownership. And um, and during the minting, each token has a unique identifier. I think that's that's the most important thing that uh, you guys need to know regarding this. Um, uh, I'm I'm curious if anyone has any questions before we can start with the minting process and how you can actually mint an NFT on the blockchain. So there's no stupid questions, okay? Especially in this because it's 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 an it's a new technology. Um, it might be hard to to understand it. So any any questions, please raise your hand and uh, and we are more than happy to to answer. If there's no no questions, we can we can start with the minting process. No. Honestly, like my first questions, I remember someone was explaining to me what blockchain is, and I had to ask them to explain it like ten times. I'm not kidding, ten times and. Still, it was a, a bit overwhelming for me, and we I took a lot of time to to understand that. But it's not a requirement for everyone. I wanted to understand it because I was shifting my whole career into Web3. But does minting mean? Yes, does mint? That's a very good question. Thank you. Please, uh, yes. Natalie, I'm yeah. going to leave the floor to you. So minting, minting, it's it's not owning. Minting is the process of where you you put. You, uh, the art piece or a post or uh, that's an art, the beauty of NFTs. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be an artwork. It doesn't have to be um, um, it doesn't have to be a video. It can be anything. It can be a post. It can be a JPEG that you have. Um, so minting is when you have when you put the NFT on the blockchain. Um, Dada, would you like to add on, on this? I think Dada's going to reply by text. By so thank you. Yes, just responding on text. But uh, Shirleen, we're going to, right now, we're, you're going to see how is the minting process. Alison, if you can just go uh, over the slides just to tell you where we should be at. Uh, these are, uh, so these are the, if you can go back to the ERCs, please. Yes, before actually, Natalie, I'm going to go quickly through this and through NFT use cases, just to give uh, people uh, just real world use cases. Who, what are the brands that are using NFTs and how? So uh, as we were saying, there is something that's called ERC, which is Ethereum request for comment. Don't mm -hmm. care about it. You're never going to use it in your life, but it's good. To know what they are so when the developers were working on the ethereum blockchain they had to find a way to be able to put a framework of standards of codes for this blockchain to be able to have nfts on it and decentralized applications where you can move your digital assets so this all needs an architecture as they say coding so what happened is that they developed a couple of Ethereum requests for comments, which is like a just big uh, bubble of, of codes that will permit you to use your non-fungible tokens and fungible tokens such as cryptocurrencies, ETH in this uh, situation to be used in these decentralized apps to be able to sell and buy and trade and all of that. And ERCs have evolved through time. So the first or second or third ERCs, they were very limited in what you can do and can do on the chain. But then, if, if I can uh, bother you, Alison, with the other slide, just the next one. We lost Alison. No, she's here. 
So here you can see the different uh, Ethereum requests for Ethereum requests for comment that have been uh, published or is of use uh, right now in the Ethereum blockchain or Ethereum virtual machines. You don't even need to know that. And you can see ERC721 is the mother of all ERC ERCs for non-fungible tokens because as we were we were saying in 2017, that was the set of uh, codes or framework that enabled us to use uh, and trade and mint NFTs on a blockchain. We have thousands now of ORCs, ERCs being built. Some of, if you would like to take a screenshot and just Google what is, for example, ERC6551, which is very interesting. It enables an NFT to hold another NFT. It's code is code is great. So. Uh, a lot of uh, evolution, uh, ERC evolution is happening now. Um, if we can skip one, please. And then we were talking about NFT uh, use cases. So NFTs are not just a picture. They can be a picture. They can be whatever you want them to be. But the use cases of NFTs are much more than art. Uh, because this is more, fun this training is more tailored to the culture and creative industry industries we're talking about nfts in that uh i'd say box but you can use nfts in different boxes and it can lead to several industries uh event ticketing for example now you don't have to have a physical uh ticket or even a digital ticket you can have your ticket as an nft and that nft can have some utility to it meaning this nft can give you access to this party and it can maybe give you a discount for something that's happening in the future. So there's value in it when you hold it. Uh, supply chain, there's a French uh, winemaker who used NFT to track and to verify the authenticity of where the wine is coming from because NFTs are stored on the blockchain and blockchain you can tamper with the data on it. So it gives that uh, end user this feeling of trust that yes, now I can tell this bottle where is it coming from and think of it it, it can work in any supply chain uh, model and not just for, for, for wines. Music, the same thing. Uh, uh, last year, uh, one of Rihanna's producers dropped an NFT for Rihanna for her song uh, called uh, Bitch Better Have My Money. Excuse my French, that's, that's the name of the uh, song. And the NFTs uh, were sold between 150 and $200, and now their value is between 5,000 to 6,000. Why? Because they held a little bit, a very tiny bit of the royalties of the song. So every time the song is played, the NFT holder is getting royalties from that song, which is amazing. NFTs are already revolutionizing the world of, of music, but just think of that as a utility for this uh, technology. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's talk about the real use cases of, of NFTs. Um, what do they do? So they connect physical or to virtual counterparts and they prevent the forgeries and they create this, I'd say, like provable scarcity. We're going to talk about how, for example, Louis Vuitton used that as well. And then gated content, meaning that if you buy into an NFT from I don't know, like Gucci, for example, you can have this gated content or gated community where you are invited to private events or you are the first to know about a, a sale happening at Gucci, for example. And then you can monetize the intellectual property of your brand by these, you know, releasing limited digital assets or limited NFTs. And then you have loyalty and engagement, just, just as you have engagement points and you know, loyalty programs, you can all convert this to be NFTs. And then building and augmenting uh, communities, that's by incentivizing users, and then that's through co-creation, co-ownership, and we're gonna also see what Nike have done about it. So I'm gonna tell you just like three use cases and give the floor back to uh, Natalie. Uh, the first use case is Louis Vuitton. So they launched an, an NFT that serves as a gateway to exclusive digital and physical collectibles from the Maison. So, and they also launched a, dis, a Discord channel. So why would Louis Vuitton be dabbling into this world? Because they want to create that gated content. They want to make people feel, especially people who 
um, you know, wear or buy Louis Vuitton, that they are exclusive, an exclusive community. And they are connecting the physical to virtual. So uh, a lot of people now have handbags or whatever you want to, they want from, from Louis Vuitton, and they can actually have that NFT or that digital uh, version uh, of it. And that's, for example, for uh, Louis Vuitton. We can also talk about Coca-Cola. They launched Masterpiece. So it's an NFT collection. Uh, and the, it has like the iconic, you know, uh, bottle uh, on the base. Uh, both of them are monetized. Them and, for example, Carl Lagerfield, they, he also did an NFT collection. Uh, it has like handmade ceramic statues that is also packed to an NFT. So all of this is monetizing uh, IP. Uh, if we want to talk about loyalty and engagement, for example, we, we can talk about Lufthansa. So Lufthansa also uh, launched an NFT loyalty program and uh, you can turn it into a collectible and you can trade cards and trade points. And it really brings out that uh, engagement aspect that all brands want to have from their, um, uh, from their, uh, from the end user or from their communities. So yes, that's that's for me. Uh, we're gonna see more NFT use cases uh, and actually um, how to mint this NFT first, and then some actual use cases with Natalie. So I just want to reply. Did you reply to Shireen's question about? So since NFTs are digital, how come wine bottles um, apply here? Okay, so that's. Uh, that's that's a very important question so nfts are can be used as a ticket so the, it can be um for example you go to a concert or you want to buy a specific wine so you can buy the nft and and then you have the transaction you have the original piece in your wallet and this way it verifies that you can buy this kind of wine or you can enter this concert through the nft um also, uh, Lucy's asking, do I need I'm, to have my? I'm sorry. Yes, uh, I think I think what Charlene was asking, how are the physical bottles? How do you have physical bottles, but you have NFTs uh, as well? Yes, I understood now your question. So, so the thing is that the NFT is think of it as a digital certificate for this physical bottle. So I went to this shop. I bought this bottle and he was like, hey, you get to have an NFT. And this is a certificate of authenticity of where the wine is coming from, what year was it made, and all of these details. So by, by this, they're just showing their clients or the end user uh, this trust that no one can ever alter these informa this information that is stored on the blockchain. For example, some people would lie about the year or the make, so and no, no one can know. You as an end user can only read what's on the bottle and hope that it's true. But in blockchain, it's it's much more authentic and much more uh, safe and secure than than that. And Lucy, do I need to have my work copyrighted before minting? Interesting. So when you mint, you own the rights anyhow. So even if you have copyrighted your work before or not, that's another story, that's another world. Whenever you just mint, it is automatically uh, copyrighted, mm -hmm. if, if uh, you'd like to say, and also not copyrighted if, you, if someone would want to use your uh, photo, like if, you, if someone wants to, I'm sorry, resell your photo, you can add royalties to that and just be making secondary sales out of your uh, photo. Yes, I would like to touch on, on Lucy's question because I'm also a photographer. So uh, what I do is that I sell my work on NFTs and then through the smart contract, I make sure like I want to have, uh, if this if this art piece sells, I want to have 15% if my collector sells it again. And then in the smart contract, I would add if I want, uh, for example, um, I don't want the, my my collector to print it. I want to print it and bring them to to them. Or maybe perhaps I'd allow I allow my collector to print this piece, but but he can't sell it. You know, at the end of the day, that's the beauty of the, a smart contract that you can control what you want when when you are selling. Um, I I hope that that was clear. Where is and Natalie? 
Can you? I'm here still. Can you let me know which slide um, I need to go to for your presentation? Uh, okay. Can you go next? Uh, let me see. There's a slide about minting. So now we're gonna start the minting slide. Let me check its page. Oh, it just jumped back as well. So I'll try yeah. to go ahead. Yeah, go to the the right, right, right. Um. Yes, more. More, more, more. Okay, wait, wait. Uh, one back. back. Yeah. yeah, when it starts with MetaMask. Uh, another, another one back. Okay, yeah, right. Sorry, sorry. Right. So the right, first one is the wallet. About the wallet. Right. Oh, yes, this one. MetaMask this one. wallet. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So before before putting any NFT, you basically need a wallet. So what's a wallet? Wallet, let's imagine like your normal wallet, but you have it on the blockchain. So it's a, a it's not a tangible uh, uh, wallet. You can't touch it, but it would be shown in your, um, let's say if, if you have Chrome, you can show, you can find it on the right side, um, of the browser. So you create a MetaMask, you download it. It can be on your phone or it can be on the computer. So you set up a wallet, you install it, you put your information. Um, can I have the other slide, please? So here you set up a wallet. So as you see, there's uh, something called secret recovery phase. So once you set up the wallet, they're going to give you a secret phrase. For example, it's going to say, happy yesterday, ball, tomorrow. So this is the secret phase that you're going to receive once you install the wallet. So you write this phase on a piece of paper or on the computer or somewhere safe that no one can see it. If anyone has access to this a secret phase, phrase, they can they can steal all your money that you have in this wallet so it's something pressure precious like gold you have to keep it somewhere safe where no one can see it so they don't access your wallet um, and if you if you lose it then you you won't a be able to access your wallet if you lose the password of the wallet so this secret phase is super important um can we go to the right please yeah so as you see, this is this is how the wallet would look. You can see buy, send, swap, and down the assets. So Ethereum or or uh, Ethereum works on MetaMask. Um, so there's different wallets for each uh, cryptocurrency. For example, uh, another cryptocurrency is Tezos. So Tezos is another. Uh, crypto and platform that you can use and sell and buy NFTs. So the wallet would look differently. But we are showing you today the MetaMask wallet because it's the most common one that everyone uses. But um, in your free time, I can send some links, uh, whoever is interested of other wallets and other cryptocurrencies that you guys can use. Um, so next. So after, after you set up your wallet, there is more than one um, user-friendly sites that you can use to sell your NFTs and buy NFTs. Um, the main one is OpenSea. So OpenSea was the first uh, website that they created to sell and buy NFTs. Um, and it's user friendly. Uh, you can set up, they have new features and stuff. They keep updating. So you just open your profile um, and you put your name and you put an image of maybe yourself or maybe what you present for your art or maybe for what a project. It can be an, even a project and doesn't have to be personal. No one has to even know who you are. Um, next. So after you open your profile, they're going to ask you to connect your wallet to this uh, to this site. Otherwise, you can't uh, really um, be, be able to sell and, and receive um, 
uh, crypto without connecting your NFT wallet. So you connect it to the OpenSea next. Um, so here you press connect and, and they're gonna ask you for a password and that password you created once you have your wallet and it connects directly to the to the website of OpenSea. And then this is the most important part, signature. So once you sign, that means that you are allowing this site to access your wallet, okay? That's why you have to also be very careful every time you open a new site uh, to make sure that it is the original site before signing. Because if you sign on a wrong site, they can steal all your money, you know? Okay, next. Um, you can create, and then once you signed up, you have your profile, uh, you have your project, um, you can create a collection. So once you create a collection, uh, you can add what you want to add on this collection. Okay, Alison, can we go next? So this is how you would create your profile. So you can put a logo image, and then there's a banner image. And then you create your collection, yes. And through that, uh, people can open it and access and see everything that you're minting. So this is the minting minting process, by the way. Um, so once your collection is uploaded, you add the items that you want in your collection. So next, the name. Uh, if there's an external link, you'd like to put your portfolio as an artist or maybe your website of where you sell uh, your products or the website of uh, of of a event uh, regarding this collection, you can add it and then a full description of what your collection means. Um, Dada will be speaking more about the description and how you can market your collection and actually uh, be able to sell. So next. So, okay, so unlockable content. So this is a feature that uh, people use, not very common. It's where you can hide your NFT and once your collector buys your NFT, they would see it. They would uh, see it. Sorry, can someone mute? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so you can choose to to make it an unlockable content or not but preferably as a beginning per, if you're beginning in nft selling it and the buying i prefer for you not to have an unlockable content people would like to see and know what your work is about unless you are someone famous and you are well known and people are coming because they know you okay next uh, this is the same, the name, the external link, yeah. And on the blockchain, so so you have the, op the option to choose which blockchain you would like. Usually it is Ethereum. As we said, it is the most common one. Um, and then you press create, and that's it. This is how you create it. Next. So here we, I'm going to go to Dada. She's going to speak more about the marketing part and how can you actually sell awesome i hope you guys can hear me well that was an awesome job from lara and natalie i'm not sure if um allison you have the deck on web3 marketing or maybe i can try share my my screen it's uh that i think it's on the same one no go oh. no no this one so the next slide would be this one. Um, is it in the earlier, perhaps? If not, um, perhaps, Dada, do you want to try and share? OK, sure. That doesn't work. Feel free to send me your slide deck, and I'll upload it. OK, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Um, perhaps okay. well, if you click on the bottom right, yes, um, exactly. We can zoom in and then we have the full image. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Better? Okay. 
So, hey guys, we're going to be talking about how to market your NFTs. You've learned about how to create them. You've learned about the technology that's behind them and why they're useful to your business. So the next step, you've created your NFT. What next? Um, one of the common words you'll hear, aside from decentralization, transparency, security, um, and all these technical terms, when you come to the soft skills, is Web3 communities. And you hear about communities, you hear about people saying you need to collaborate, you need to co-create, you need to do this, and you need to do that. And that is because when it comes to the blockchain, strength is in numbers, belief, and opportunities. People buy into PFPs with 10,000 um, uh, limited editions, and they begin building things uh, onto the blockchain, um, aside from just a community. They begin impacting um, larger communities beyond the blockchain. And uh, the reason this works is because everyone has a role in the community. And uh, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how difficult, we're all impacting into one larger community. So this is a group of individuals who share a common interest, whether it's a cryptocurrency um, like ETH, uh, Bitcoin, Tezos, whether it's a project um, like, let's say if GIZ CCI had a, you know, like an art project, we would have a community called GIZ CCI project, um, or a blockchain technology. So that can be any decentralized app. It can be anything you can literally think of. And these communities can be virtual and that does not limit them, you know, to being a physical community. We see, um, we see communities that are built onto the blockchain um, nowadays, mostly having meetups, having summits, having conferences. So um, with a Web3 community, members can share digital ownership secured by the blockchain, usually through gating with the sales of social tokens. So meaning if we're all here together, uh, let's say maybe the only reason you would be here is because you own a GIZ, a GIZ CCI token. And that allows you into every single webinar you can think of, whether it's the very first session we ever did on Web3 policy, whether you didn't come for the second session or the third session, but you were able to make it on the fourth session. The fourth session, it guarantees that you're part and parcel of the community and you're able to add more value and you're able to get roles within the community to impact um, the larger cause or the vision. So there are many types of communities and the main thing that you need to know when it comes to Web3 communities is that not all communities are DAOs, but all DAOs are communities. And just to explain what a DAO is, you've probably heard this word uh, a lot if you're in the, into the Web3 space. This is a decentralized autonomous organization. And basically these are organizations that are backed and built by um, using the blockchain technology or they apply use cases using blockchain technology such as NFTs, such as tokens, um, many things. And there's network states such as Afropolitan states, uh, Afropolitan state, and other types of communities are kind of like uh, either subjective or objective. You see communities that are built on interest. Uh, Seed Club specifically focuses on communities that are in their upcoming and uh, um, seed funding stage. So they're focused on finding and funding communities on their seed stage. So that is their interest, okay? There's action-based communities. Let's say we have, I would, I would consider GIZ CCI project an action-based community. We are here to learn more and to impact more um, knowledge within the creative and cultural industries. So that is action-based. World of Women is empowering women to onboard onto the blockchain. It's empowering the representation of women onto the blockchain. So that is an action-based community. 
The third is a place or location-based community, whereby you have people within one location coming together to form you know, a blockchain community. So we have Brussels DAO, we have Dakar DAO from Senegal, we have Niger DAO, and you'll probably see a lot more DAOs coming up in the future um, that represent countries. Um, so that is location-based communities. Um, there's practice-based communities, which is like talent DAO, which is like nouns DAO. Maybe I create a nurses DAO. Maybe I create a creatives guild DAO. Um, as you can see, these communities are built up on any vision. As long as you have a couple of people who see and feel they can impact the vision, then you can form a DAO, but it is very difficult. <laughs> it is very difficult. And the last one is circumstance based communities. So this is when you have a festival in a specific place or you have um, a conference in a specific place or just a casual meetup in a specific place and you have to create a community for that DAO at that moment or it was decided at that moment that you have to do it. So that is a constance based communities. So what motivates these communities? And I hope there's no question so far if there is um, feel free to, to reach out. Okay, so what motivates these communities? Simple, why are we all here? We want to learn how to make money from our crafts, right? We want to earn a living. We want to get forward with what we do and what we're building. So the key thing that you will see is money-motivated communities. Many people jump into crypto for the lucrative investments that it can offer. And while these communities can help inform newcomers about your project um, and will often work in your project's best interest as they are investors, they can quickly dry up if the token price drops. What does it mean? If I have a Dada NFT, and all of you believe in Dada because I'm here right now and maybe I'm a mentor, and a Dada NFT is probably like $5,000, let's say. And obviously you all want to make money from the Dada NFT, so you collect the Dada NFT. But tomorrow I'm not showing up and uh, I'm not marketing my work anymore. And I say, I'm done with NFTs. Um, what happens? What happens to your community? It rug pulls, it crashes. And that usually is the problem with uh, communities that are not solid to the foundations of what uh, the blockchain has to offer. And if you jump into communities because of money, one way or another, <laughs> you will regret. Um, so my key, uh, for me, what I believe most uh, successful communities have achieved is being a belief motivated community. And this is the type of community that is strong and tightly knit. They believe in the mission, the vision and goals, and they will help drive everything that you discuss forward. This is also where the best contributors and collaborators can be found. Not to say that belief motivated communities do not make money. It's just not a cash cow or it's not a cash grab um, for lack of a better word. So sometimes, and from what I've seen, a lot of these belief motivated communities are in it for the long term. And you don't have to worry about waking up tomorrow and the community you've invested time and money into is simply gone. So each type of community has their own value. And more often than not, these two are not mutually exclusive. So how do you grow and sustain these Web3 communities? The honest truth about being in the NFT space, being in the Web3 ecosystem, is that you really have to get into the culture. Without it, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to make it. If you stay um, in the same crowds that you have been before and you expect to sell your NFTs, it won't happen. If you stay in the same communities, the same Web2 communities that you've been in before, and you want to launch or have a startup within the Web3 communities, you will not succeed. You need to understand the culture. And the culture is rapidly evolving, which means you need to be engaged into the community. You need to 
connect with people. You need to know who's working on what. You need to know why they're working on these things. Having this overview makes Web3 so special because it is the first step to grow a thriving Web3 community. A lot of these communities are building solutions, right? To build a solution, there has to be a problem. So many people are working on real life problems and you'll find strong communities behind them. Um, and many things are changing depending on the market, right? And there's different supply, different demand for different time, you know, time frames within the market. So it's important to know your, your own community and its needs and solutions. If you want to build your community, why are you doing it, right? Why, why do you think the community needs you to build this space? Why are you curating that? Is it because women are underrepresented within the technology space? Why? So you need to know the why about what you are building and why you need a community to support this. By building a community is also learning to know who your audience is what they need and how to best cater to them and in due time. It's not just about now. Um, when it comes to these solutions, when it comes to, you know, finding um, solutions to problems, it has to have, you have to be very future forward. Obviously now is, you know, being in the present is amazing, but you are told within the blockchain space that you are so early that a lot of the things you expect to be mapped out are really not and are also in the process of you know being solved so it's a long term journey and you have to be very future forward and by that you know if people are going to tr invest and trust in you not just now but tomorrow and 10 years ahead or 5 years ahead you need to clarify your goals with your community otherwise people will not be able to support you when you're vague or when you don't really understand what you are doing, or if you look confused, then your community will be confused. So it will be wise to clarify your goals uh, with your Web3 community. Ask for advice. I will go to Lara and tell Lara, what do you think about this community that I'm building? Would you invest in it? What would you change about it? Talk to the people who have interest in what you're doing, even if they're not 100% supporting you, because within the blockchain space, you'll find people are very skeptical, even to invest or buy an NFT, um, unless they are like a coveted or like a known NFT collector, it will be difficult to just um, kind of approach anyone and tell them, hey, I'm selling NFTs, please buy this, you know? Um, people need to understand what you're doing. The next thing is to find the best platforms and tools to build your NFT or Web3 community efficiently, which are the top uh, um, social media sites uh, and tools is probably uh, Twitter, which is nowadays known as X. And uh, you'll also hear a lot of people in Discord groups. You'll hear a lot of people in Telegram groups. And I've also seen a lot of uh, NFT communities nowadays on Twitter. No, sorry, on Instagram. Um, so finding a lot of these uh, spaces um, or communities or building your, or using these platforms to build your community will help you with your visibility, right? You can't just be, you know, you can't just tell people you have a platform or a community and they cannot find you. Within the blockchain space, people are very skeptical, right? Because it's already, Although it offers security, there's a lot of scams. So if you find a way to stand out and to identify yourself, not particularly dox yourself, just build a hub where people can identify with what you're doing, it would be wise as well. Um, another thing is to learn from the existing communities and support existing communities. What am I saying here is if my project failed, and you know my project failed and you've seen um, what I did or how I moved to make it fail, I don't expect you to make the same mistake. I expect you to do something different. I expect you to connect with me and find out why I failed and find out how I could move forward. Uh, you'd be surprised um, how collaborative the, the Web3 and the NFT space is, right? Um, people are willing to, you know, reiterate their lessons on and on and on. 
So don't make the same uh, mistakes a lot of these communities are making out there, okay? Find, um, you know, your own pace, find your own beat, but also learn from other people's lessons, right? Keep the community up to date, harvest feedback and get them involved. We've already spoken about this. We've spoken about interacting with your audience, interacting with your collectors, you know? Um, talk to them, ask them why they collect your work. Some of them will respond, some of them won't. Um, trying to engage with them builds um, a more intimate relationship whereby they support you um, more intricately. And it's not just a matter of, you know, making money off of your NFT. This is how you also find long-term collectors, right? Long-term supporters for your Web3 brands or your Web3 communities. The last one, consistency, guys. You have to be consistent in showing up for what you believe in. If you believe your NFT should be 0.5 ETH, then let it be known on Twitter, Discord, Telegram groups, all these things. Let it be known that you are selling your NFT. You can't um, start marketing your NFT today, tomorrow, and then the next week you're off. And then the next month you're back on. It will... It is difficult, but consistency will bring you a lot of rewards within the Web3 space. And I hope there's still no questions. Okay, 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 okay. So we're still talking about the ways to market your NFTs. And the first thing that I will tell you is you should tell your story. You come into the NFT space, into the Web3 ecosystem, and there's so many phenomenal things happening. There's so much sophisticated technology, and you meet the best of the best, but you're here for a reason, right? You're the best of the best. So tell your story exactly how it is, exactly how you want to represent yourself. People are drawn to the story behind the creations, sharing your creative processes, your inspirations, or, you know, any interesting anecdotes related to your NFTs. Um, this is also a process that um, widens your content when it comes to how you're marketing your NFTs. Unfortunately, I wish I could tell you it's, you know, as easy as just posting one image of your NFT and it sells out, but that takes years, if not months of connection and cultivating community and cultivating collectors, right? So you have to be very consistent in marketing your NFTs. You have to show up a specific type of way, but most importantly, remember to stay true to your identity and true to your art. If you come around and find 3D art is making more money than photography NFTs, I'm not saying don't try to change, experiment, but stick to your story, stick to what you know and stick to what you believe you desire to achieve from the blockchain and from selling your NFT, right? Be transparent. Be transparent about your journey, your vision and your future plans. Authenticity will attract a loyal fan base. Um, for example, when I was starting out my, my first NFTs, I was creating my, my art on my phone and um, Honestly, I didn't think it was special. I didn't think it was different. So I never used to tell that story. But the minute um, my first few collectors picked up my pieces and I wanted to engage with them, they asked me um, uh, what graphics tablet I use. And I told them I use my phone. And it became such a huge thing. And they were even more wowed by you know, the, the craftsmanship. And after that, they kind of bought more pieces and I was able to buy my first graphics tablet, which was insane, right? Um, so stick to what, um, stick to your vision and tell your collectors your future plans, tell your audience your future plans. Web3 is a space of transparency. Communicate to these people and you would be surprised what you're able to earn out of it, right? How to market your NFTs again, quality, and uniqueness and i don't know i don't know you i don't know your art but when i talk about quality i mean by the level of your standards right it doesn't have to be anyone else's standard 
but just know that not everything needs to be tokenized, right? And this will similarly be transparent to anyone, open to everyone on the blockchain to see for a very, very long time. So if I was building my repertoire as an artist or as a creative, what would I want to be seen? The best of the best, right? The best of my best. And the best can be experimental and the best should be unique, right? At the end of it all, it is non-fungible. So make sure it's something that is of high quality. Make sure it's something unique. I'm not saying change your artwork. I'm just saying be more craftful with what you are minting, right? Make sure it is polished, make sure it is also worth what you are selling. If I'm minting an NFT and selling it at two Ethereum, uh, I have to make sure that it is worth the price. Otherwise it's gonna be on the, on the platform for a very long time and you may not be able to attract collectors or buyers. Aside from original artwork, Limited editions or exclusive content tend to attract more buyers and collectors. If I tell my collectors right now that I'm selling an NFT, and after that, I will be able to send you an extra NFT, it's not only a win for me that I get to have one collector with two of my art pieces, but it's also for them in return, right? They have gotten more than what they bargained for. If they paid 0.3 ETH and the other one was worth 0.5 ETH, now they have two artworks worth 0.8 ETH. So you can see it's like a win-win situation, right? So don't forget to experiment on different chains too. You can mint your NFTs on different blockchains, different platforms, right? We spoke about that in the first presentation. So you can use different blockchain platforms um, to showcase different NFTs, um, right? You can have um, some of your art going onto the Tezos blockchain. Maybe it could be experimental, limited editions. And then when it comes to the Ethereum blockchains, you have your one-on-ones. Maybe you are on the BNB chain. You can have your PFP there. So keep experimenting, especially when the market is not good, <laughs> which is kind of like right now, and keep building um, your portfolio. We've already spoken about this. Um, engage with your community. Participate in online communities related to NFTs, which means forums, which means uh, social media groups and these Discord channels. If GIZ CCI project is having a Twitter space next week, show up for the Twitter space, speak on the Twitter space, tell them what you're working on. Um, and actually a lot of the ways that I grew most of my audience was by attending clubhouse calls, by talking about my art, talking about the inspiration behind my art and uh, you know, showing people um, how curated the experience is to the final composition. People really rock with that stuff, right? So engage with the community, comment, and you know, share other people's work, right? It's not just about you when you are in the Web3 community. My collector could be on Lara's Twitter you know, timeline. So if she retweets my work, I get a collector. And sometimes it's really as simple as that, you know? You never know who's watching and you never know who is connected to who. So keep supporting the community as you create your fan base. Collaborate well, with I, artists. I just want to add something very small to that, not to the training itself, but to something that you said that really resonates with me is the existing community of Web3 people. So it's sometimes it's very much hard to understand the community and the culture, but when you're in it, you're in your safe bubble. And I remember when I moved to this um, to, to this world, I was very much overwhelmed. It was male dominated. I couldn't understand the tech. Uh, I, I shied away. But then I found a lot of women in this space, women and men, to be honest. And they were both like, you can do it. It's, it's not really hard. Let's have a coffee. I'll tell you more about DeFi. I'll tell you more about, I don't know, whatever vertical of, of this um, industry. And they were all doing it for free. Not because they want something out of it. They want to spread the knowledge because they know that Web3 is a movement. And I always say it, it's sprung from the people to the people. We control 
what we put out there and we control what we want to invest our money in. And this community is, is crucial. I remember lots of opportunities came for me from like a simple Web3 networking where I met this like awesome woman who said, would you like to be on board on this project or on that project? And I also met a lot of people who I connected to other people. So it's it's really a very healthy web that is being uh, sprung. And even me, Natalie and Dada, we just met a couple of months ago and now we work as if we worked for years. It's really this ethos and it's it's really more about you and your principles than about you know the technology itself. Sorry, Dada. Oh, no, thank you. That was amazing. Thank you for adding on to that. Absolutely. And aside from that, you never know um, how inspired you're going to get just by connecting with one person. Um, there's a lot I've learned from Lara. There's a lot I've learned from Natalie. There's a lot I've learned from Heike. So it's really exciting to be able to connect with different people. And if you want to take it a notch higher and level up your game, find these artists and collaborate with them. You know? I'm gonna connect with Lara and be like, please let's create an art piece together. And um, by this, um, you get to expose your work to a wider audience, which is not just yours, but also Lara's and the people within Lara's um, communities will, will be able to also access your work. So try collaborate with artists and uh, influencers and see where that takes you because you never know who's watching. That's what I'll say, especially with the Web3 world. Um, aside from that, the next one is use social media marketing. In a world, you know, in the world of technology, being on social media is so important when it comes to showcasing your NFTs and being present um, in these, in all these avenues will help you grab more attention from a wider audience, right? So the most common uh, social media that is used by, um, by NFT artists and collectors is Twitter and Discord. Um, Instagram is more so for curation. I've seen a lot of communities curate um, NFT art. So you can reach out to a lot of these um, communities. There's like African NFT curated and they curate um, NFTs minted within the continent and from the diaspora. So being featured in a community's page could be just as consistent every day in showcasing yourself. Find people with more views to help you share and support your vision, right? Showcase your NFTs. Don't mint an NFT and sit on it. Especially if you're not famous, you're not going to sell it, okay? That's the harsh truth, but it's not gonna be sold. And depending on the type of NFT you sell, it's gonna be either more difficult or even more simpler, right? I think one of the most important ways that um, I have learned to market my NFTs is through auctions and uh, um, basically exhibitions. So being part of and you will see this within the, the NFT and Web3 space. There's so much opportunity, guys. And I'm talking about international world-class opportunities whereby all you have to do is, you know, fill in a form um, or sign up on a platform to be able to exhibit in New York, Times Square, or like in Art Dubai, which sometimes costs money. But the thing about already being um, on the blockchain or already having NFTs is it does cost money. Minting an NFT costs money. So go the extra step and participate in these NFT exhibitions. Join collectives that will empower, empower exhibitions and set up exhibitions, right? So um, one of the major exhibitions that you see people bragging about or being happy about is NFT NYC. Um, you could be showcased at Miami at Basel. I've seen people being showcased as super chief in Tokyo. So there's many, many places um, that you can have your art showcased. And it's every single year throughout the year, every other month, there is an NFT exhibition happening and auctions being held in different places all over the world that is open to 
international people, right? So host auctions, um, not just in exhibitions, but also in popular NFT marketplaces. Um, unfortunately, OpenSea is not the most curated marketplace. What does that mean? It's easy for your art to get drowned. It's easy for you to um, get lost in, you know, all that sauce, right? Um, so being part or, of niched down marketplaces or uh, NFT marketplaces that are curated specifically for specific um, genres will help you stand out more, right? Join, try to join Foundation, try to join Maker's Place, try to join Super Rare, try to join um, even local based uh, platforms that are coming up. They may help you with your marketing, they may help you with positioning yourself in front of, you know, high spending um, collectors. And um, I think that will push you into also um, expanding the quality of your craft. Once you understand you're on a curated platform, you see what is on there, you see the type of art people are creating, you get to work on yourself. Um, that is if you need it. You get to work on yourself and you get to work on your craft and visually present yourself in a specific way. So limited editions are also one of the ways that you can market your NFTs or rather make money from NFTs because there's many ways you can make money from NFTs, right? It doesn't have to be just one of one. Um, so having PFPs, limited editions, um, and scarcity can drive demand to your work. But this is also once you've already nurtured a community or a cultic fan base is what I call it, right? People who are on the line waiting for you to drop an NFT. And believe me, it happens. There's people who have curated that kind of urgency within their NFT communities. And a lot of what you'll see is through limited editions, mostly priced at a lower starting point um, as opposed to one of ones. Um, so you'll find they'll release maybe 10 editions or even 100 editions, depending on the size of your community, based on a low price point. And they all sell out in minutes, if not seconds, right? So continue to put yourself out there, um, not just in exhibitions, but also large marketplaces that are curated, right? Um, engage with your collectors, guys. Um, interact with the people who are buying your art as i said you don't have to understand what made them buy the art but for them to feel like um they're connected to you you may engage with what they post um maybe you don't resonate but you may just like share um for those who are daring reach out to your collectors ask them about their lives ask them about why they like your piece Ask them about where they're from and uh, how they got into NFTs. Becoming friends with your collectors is one of the ways you make sure that they're long term because it's not bad, but one of the worst things is like having one one off sales whereby you have like one ETH and he never collects from you again or, or she never collects from you again, right? You want them to keep coming back. You need them to keep on seeing the value in you. And that doesn't mean you have to get intimate with them, but showing them support as well can be one of the ways that you rope them in for the long term, right? So show them appreciation for their support and offer them incentives for repeat purchases. Just as I said, if uh, Lara has collected my art piece and um, I know Lara really loves my work and supports my work, I will tell Lara that, okay, Lara, I can send you another piece because I know how much you love my work and I know that this has value to you and the both of us. And I gift Lara something else, right? Not just an NFT, um, could be even tokens, right? I send Lara some USDT or I send Lara some Tezos, which is counterproductive for the collectors, but hey, um, many people would love that if I send them free USDT with each purchase of an NFT. That would be amazing. I, I would personally buy something. <laughs> so build a loyal customer fan base. And uh, a lot of these collectors will end up sharing your artwork with more collectors, whereby they, they kind of sell you to, you know, 
they sell your identity kind of your, or how do I say this in the right way that didn't come out well um, but they kind of um, they empower you when it comes to the eyes of other collectors right they say oh my god there's Dada and you need to see her art and then she gifted me this other new NFT and it was worth I don't know how many ETH or maybe nothing but I really love the art so it gets to build uh, a, a loyal fan base and a more engaging fan base. And you will be surprised how many more collectors will hear about you from one collector. So the next thing is promotions and giveaways. And although a lot of people are against uh, lowering the mint prices of already existing NFTs, one of the ways that you can attract um, um, collectors or like a new audience is by offering discounts or by playing around with um, the price of your art, right? Not all the time one ETH, not all the time two ETH, not all the time 0 0.03 ETH, right? Play around with the, with the levels of art and how much you want to price them. This will make sure that you attract any and every sort of person who is out there to consume your art. They're not limited to, um, you know, having tens of thousands of dollars. And um, you'll find a lot more support in actually um, playing around with uh, the price of your art. Um, but if you are also hard-headed like me, um, shoot for the sky and stay there and keep going up, right? What you could do is giveaways. And giveaways don't need you to reduce the price of your art or reduce the price of your NFT, whatever type of NFT you're selling, right? So hosting giveaways and especially giveaways on expensive art can increase your visibility and attract potential um, buyers, right? If I'm giving out a piece worth 0 0.5 ETH from a collection that has already sold 3 ETH, people will fight for that, right? People will share my artwork and my pages for that, right? So give exclusive offers as a way of marketing your NFTs and make it coveted. Don't give away art every other month unless you have a really large community and, you know, but don't give away um, something extremely valuable. You have to make them, you know, earn it. Um, so provide utility or benefits for your NFT. And this is controversial because um, creatives uh, don't like talking about utility. I also believe, you know, your art is the utility. You creating is the gift of it all. But unfortunately, in like the economic space we live in or like um, this blockchain space specifically, which is... Uh, Extreme, an extremely logical space and technical space, people are looking for additional benefits or utility along with, you know, the art or your NFTs, whatever you're selling as your NFT, right? So people have found ways to tie physical, uh, physical um, objects to digital assets, right? And you'll find uh, people who say, if you buy my NFT, you'll be allowed into virtual metaverse events. Or if you buy my NFT, it will allow you to um, buy coffee in any coffee shop in Kenya at 10% off. That's a utility, right? Um, a utility could really be anything. A donation to a charity. It could be travel miles, travel tickets. It could be unlocking more BTS of your NFT creation. It could be really anything. So provide value beyond the digital at asset and that can attract more collectors and buyers. Build a website or a portfolio. Um, this is so important and this is even beyond NFTs, right? For whatever job that you're going to um, achieve out there, you need to curate and uh, build a well-designed um, space that adds credibility to your work, where people can see what you've been up to, how long you've been up to. Um, people need proof that you, you're actually doing what you, you, you talk about, especially in the blockchain where you can be anonymous. So having a website or a portfolio that is professional, right? Showcasing um, not just 
one NFT collection could be, you know, each of your NFT collections could showcase your unsold NFT collections or even your upcoming NFT collection. Um, it increases credibility to your work and uh, it is easier for you to also attract opportunities because you'll find these spaces asking for your website. You don't have one because you're a blockchain artist. You see, um, you need to be on your A game. As I told you, you're meeting the best of the best, right? So you need to go the extra mile. You need to create your portfolio. You need to, if you need to curate a new portfolio, do that. If you need to um, even build a website using Canva, do that. So. Uh, make sure it's well designed, make sure it's articulate on what you're doing. And uh, yeah, so I think this should even be my last tip on what to do is you need to stay updated and adapt to one, the trends that are happening within the Web3 ecosystem and the NFT space. These are different places, right? Um, Web3 is the larger space, right? NFT is like a bubble within the Web3 ecosystem. So you need to follow these trends and be very future forward in regards to what part of the Web3 ecosystem is moving now and why is it moving? It will help you to adapt to new strategies and it will also most importantly help you to stay relevant in a space that is changing more and more each day, right? Two, stay updated and adapt to feedback. This is the most important, especially if you're building a fan base or a community. If people tell you that um, a specific type of content is not working out when you're marketing your NFTs, listen, go back and reiterate your lesson and find a way to paraphrase it or come back with something new um, that you can share with people, right? And it's not just about, as Lara said, it's not just about everyone. But sometimes, you know, um, when many people kind of uh, give you feedback on one specific shortcoming, it's best to cut your losses um, instead of trying to prove them wrong, um, especially if it's something that has been tested and proven, right? So this is also a matter of ethos and ethics. Maybe um, you touched on a nerve that is kind of um, sensitive to the community. That happens all the time, right? You lose some, you win some. So remember the NFT market can be competitive and volatile. Building a strong brand and engaging with your audience and staying adaptable are key components of a successful NFT and Web3 marketing strategy. So be experimental with the things that you do, but don't forget to be disciplined um, on the blockchain. So that's uh, it for me. I'm wondering if there is any questions concerning how to market your NFTs or maybe something that I've forgotten, Lara or Natalie could chip in. Um, thank you. Natalie, Natalie is on fire on the uh, question and answers. Dada, thank you very, very much. I personally enjoyed this so much because a lot of people don't give space for, for how the community, how detrimental it is if you uh, don't build the community right. So thank you very much. Dada, are these going to be um, available to our attendees, your slides? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Great. And if you want to tell us more about the POAP that they're getting uh, after this. Yes, I almost forgot. Yes, 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 yes. Guys, for any of you who have never minted an NFT before, you're going to receive a special certificate in the form of an NFT. And I'll be able to send it to everyone who has joined the call. And you'll be able to mint it free of charge, right? and hold it as proof of attendance that you participated during this call. So show it off and rock it and be sure to mint it before um, the weekend because it expires. Also, uh, thank you, Dada. That is actually amazing. Like every, every point of marketing was just said. Um, I feel like everyone that's here, you should go through the slides again because these are so on point and they're gonna help you so much 
after minting uh, your collection or your work. The, we have a lot of questions on, on the chat about like how to mint and do not worry, we, we will have like a one-to-one -one, uh, coaching session to the people that are interested in minting and we can help. Um, but this we will send you emails and, and throughout the emails we can discuss a session for anyone who's interested. Uh, great, and we're going to be following up by email uh, for the next process, the one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring. We're going to send you all of the details uh, via email. Uh, if there are any questions uh, before we let you guys go, sorry for that very long 90-minute uh, training, but, and we try to condense it as much as we can. And yeah, can anyone... Any um, also, I was thinking perhaps we can also create like a group for everyone that participated. Um, so if anyone has questions, we can answer. Maybe perhaps we can do like a Discord group or or a WhatsApp group. We will send that um, also by email, so each one can access it and 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 be part of it. And then there we can speak more about the one on one. Uh, sessions and how to to have the free certificate because I feel like that uh, some people will not know how to access it and have it on their wallets. Maybe we can make a, after we do the group. Uh, maybe we can make a small um, just record our screens of how things go and just send it to our friends now. Friends, F R E N S is what they use in Web3 to say a friend. So if you have yes. a friend, so we're all friends now. 